ad nomu nero da yore do dor por maz dera yo man de khora ho man namaz o ashma shahanshah Hormuz the 1st was the third Sasanian king of kings his name in Middle Persian was synonymous with Ahura Mazda, the supreme deity in Zoroastrianism. His full personal name was a combination of Hormizd and the familial Ardashir, which translated loosely to whose reign is through truth. He was the grandson of Ardashir, the empire's founder and third born of Shapur's children. His two older brothers were Bahram and Shapur Meshan Shah. The youngest boy was Narsa, who would go on to provide some stability to the empire in the future. Hormizd also had two sisters, Adur Anahid and Shapur Duhtak. Upon Shapur's deathbed in May of the year 270, he crowned Hormizd as the new Shah and Shah of Iran. We know precious little of his reign, but some information has survived to the present day. We believe he was likely responsible for providing the Zoroastrian priest carter clothes, usually worn only by the upper class. These were the cap and belt, and along with this a title created to signify chief priest. We also know that while he performed these actions for Zoroastrianism, he also continued to maintain support for Mani. It has been suggested this was done to retain state control over both religions. He also created additional holy days, but was considered, as with his predecessors, only a lukewarm Zoroastrian. Under his reign, we also have the founding of Ram Hormizd Ardashir, which translates loosely to Ardashir's Peace of Hormizd. This city survives into the present day and is the current capital of Khuzestan province in Iran, a city of some quarter of a million people. We also have under Hormizd a change in the wording of the realm's coinage from just King of Kings of Iranians to include and non-Iranians. We don't know how he died, but after just 13 months of rule, he would be succeeded not by his son, but by his older brother Bahram. It is thought that Bahram was originally overlooked by Shapur given that Bahram's wife was of lower social standing. Bahram's reign would usher in an end to the religious tolerance towards minority religions in the empire. Under Shapur I, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, and Hindus could all practice their religions freely and openly. Shapur had also been friendly towards the prophet Mani and included him on military expeditions. However, under Bahram, this would change. First, there was the elevated station his brother had provided Zoroastrian priests. This also increased their voice within the state. When Mani entered Gundashapur, there was an uproar in the priesthood. The priests protested and persuaded Bahram to imprison Mani. In 274, his imprisonment would turn into an execution as he was sentenced to death. What followed was further persecution of Mani's followers. These actions would form the foundation for what would eventually become the incorporation of Zoroastrianism as the state religion. Bahram was known to be a fan of combat, hunting, and equally of feasting, all of which he considered righteous activities. Upon his coronation, the world would receive one of the finest artistic examples of Sasanian rock sculpture, with the rock relief showing him receiving the diadem directly from Ahura Mazda. Bahram's reign would also be short ruling for just over three years. He would die in 274, and power would be transferred to his son, Bahram II. Bahram II was just a teenager when he would ascend the Sassanid throne. It is believed that the push for this came from the Zoroastrian priests, and most likely created friction between him and his uncle Narsa, who also stood in line to the throne as current great king of Armenia. A title and position which usually was the de facto title of the presumptive heir. Bahram II would reign during a much more turbulent geopolitical time, experiencing both external wars and internal dynastic struggles. 
he would struggle with his brother Hormuzd I of Kushan Shah, who was the king of the Kushan Empire which lay to the northeast. Hormuzd would mint coins that would change the traditional text of Great Kushan King to say, Great Kushan King of Kings. As this was happening, there was also revolts by a cousin Hormuzd of Sakistan and by a Zoroastrian high priest in Khuzestan. The Romans, never one to give up on fortuitous opportunity, would react accordingly. Carus, the current Roman emperor upon hearing of the civil conflict, took immediate advantage by launching a campaign in 283. He invaded Mesopotamia while Baram was in the east dealing with the civil strife. It is believed that Carus and his army captured Tessiphon for a time, but that shortly after Carus would die, supposedly after being struck by lightning. And shortly after his death, the Roman army would withdraw, leaving Mesopotamia to be recaptured by the Sasanians. He would be instrumental in the continued rising power of the Zoroastrian high priest Kartir, who it was believed assisted him with his ascension over Narse. He would make peace with the new Roman emperor, Diocletian, and to continue to expand his authority over vassal states. The concept of what art would show changed dramatically under Baram II. He would be the first and only Shah who would show his queen, Shapur Dukhtak, on the realm coins alongside him. Rock reliefs during this time also experienced similar changes. He would show on them images of intimacy, fights against lions, and frontal representations as most to date had been side representations. He would have at least 10 rock relief images with examples like this that have provided us with valuable information. He would reign until 293 and die young to unknown circumstances. Power would again be passed to a son, this time Baram III. But he was viewed as weak by most of the nobility and many silently or outwardly challenged his succession by pledging allegiance to his granduncle Narse. He would rule for only four months before being either captured or killed during a campaign by Narse, who would then ascend the throne in that same year. He would end up being the first Sasanian Shah to not ascend the throne as a crown prince. One account states that Narse summoned a traditional royal referendum which had been used since Ardashir's time. It is said he did this to gain approval from the aristocracy and legitimize his rule in a way that Baram III did not. It should be no surprise that Kartir would be among those who supported Narse, although during Narse's rule with this act done, it seems he would fade into obscurity. In 296, the drums of war would boom once more. Galerius, under authority of the Emperor Diocletian, would invade Mesopotamia. Three battles would be fought, the first two indecisive, with neither side gaining advantage, but the third, fought at Callinicium, would see Galerius suffer a total and complete defeat. Galerius himself, escaping with the survivors, retreating back into Syria and the city of Antioch, where he would be humiliated for this defeat by the emperor. Galerius vowed revenge and made preparations for another invasion that he would launch in the winter of 297. He and his army of 25,000 men would invade Armenia. What aided Galerius was assistance from Armenians and strong recruits from Illyria. He would surprise a camping Narse at the Battle of Satala. The mountainous and hilly terrain would favor Roman infantry over Sasanian cavalry. Also accompanying Galerius was King Tiridates, who would be reinstated as king if the Romans were victorious. Of note, from the Roman historian Lactantius, is that much like the Gauls and German tribes, the Sasanians would also bring their households on campaign with them. Two battles would be fought, resulting in Narses' defeat. He fled further into Armenia, but his household was captured as was what wealth he had with him in the mobile treasury. Galerius would continue to conquer territory, securing Nisibis in the fall of 298, before returning back to Antioch. Narses' wife, 
would live out her life in Antioch, separated from her husband as a reminder to the Persians of their loss. What followed was the Treaty of Nisibis, and despite a messenger with an offer from Narse, it would end in humiliation for him and be highly advantageous to Rome. It would, however, bring an end to the war with the Romans, at least for now. Rome also receiving large swaths of Upper Mesopotamia, which included many influential cities. Just a few years after the peace treaty of Nisibis, Narsa would die and be succeeded by his son, Hormizd II. And in the next part, we will look at the resurgence of the Sassanids under future leaders like Shapur II, he who would be the longest reigning Iranian Shah in history. <laughs>